Please help me to welcome this passionate, talented, and newly local artist, Najee Dorsey. Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry. Here go. Yeah. Hey, well, you know, man, this has been a long time coming. There's a lot of familiar faces out there, and I just want to say thank y'all for coming and being a part of this. Uh, it's a special moment. It's a special time. I want to say thanks to the Creator, you know, our Father, and many names that we call Him for giving us life today and and a community to, to embrace the arts and that's supporting the arts. Um, I've got some notes, so let me get to my notes so I won't forget anything. My mom, thank you. Dad, Soteria, 20 years. We celebrated our 20th anniversary on August 4th. And I gotta give a special shout out to Team Black Art in America as well, Doreen and Ronnie, who help us to do what we do. All my family and friends and patrons and collectors who helped to make things possible because without the patronage of the arts, I mean, where would we be? Um, again, I want to thank, thank the Columbus Museum because it's, it's rare for a living artist uh, to have a, a solo show of this magnitude, uh, let alone a living African-American artist, particularly one my age. I'm 41 years old. And so I want to say thank you to the Columbus Museum and Kristen and Tom and the entire staff because they've been fantastic. Uh, when you see the show leaving Mississippi, be sure to take a look at the permanent collection, uh, many of which uh, were pieces that I really love from leading African American artists uh, that you'll find. Now, getting to leaving Mississippi, there was a um, um, young lady by the name of Ruby Bond who took part in an oral history program um, when the country was, America was trying to document the migration of uh, African Americans from the South to the North from 1910 to 1950. And there's an excerpt in the installation upstairs that, that talk, talks about her experience and why they left the South to move up North for better opportunities. So a lot of my work is centered around migration, it's centered around our culture, it's centered around our history. But one famous quote, uh, one excerpt from her story uh, really spoke to me, and it was this. It said, many would walk for miles with only the clothes on their backs leaving Mississippi. All right. If y'all got a catalog, y'all can follow along with me. And see, so what is, what is leaving Mississippi about? I was born and raised in Blava, Arkansas, which is actually Mississippi County, Arkansas. But I think Mississippi is a great metaphor for the challenges of America. I mean, when you think about the struggles and the suffering that's happened, uh, for me, no better one word, you know, kind of sums it up like Mississippi. And so it's kind of a play on words when you think about the challenges of slavery and racism and poverty and inequality. You think about our history in, in America for the red, the black, and the brown. The first piece in the catalog is titled, uh, What Does America, what does, Is This What Democracy Looks Like? And what, what is this what democracy looks like? It's from my resistance series, which is a good portion of the reason why we, we're having this show. Uh, Kristen and Deb, they came over to my studio to figure out, to take a look at my work and um, what democracy looks like along with other works were pieces that, that really spoke to them. Since the age of five, uh, I've been creating, um, let's see, I'm sorry, I went through this. Some of my earlier influences were George Hunt, Romare Bearden, uh, my work that you'll find in the, in the galleries is mixed media collage. It's a combination of paint, fabric, photographs, and a lot of found materials. But I like to you know, use, use my work to talk about history and culture. One of the pieces that I want to talk about in the catalog is uh, Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves was the first black marshal west of the Mississippi in 1875. And by the time he retired in 1907, he had captured over 3,000 felons. Uh, many say that the story of Bass Reeves was a... Uh, um, what the Lone Ranger was loosely based on, that particular history. You know, Bass would dress up in, in character and he'd go out and he'd get, get these fugitives. Um, and, and so that's, that's part of that history. Another piece that's upstairs is an installation about the migration. It's titled Passports of Many. When you take a look at that piece, a lot of the photographs that's in that work I actually collected here in Columbus. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of families, and maybe some of your family members out there. 
Let's see. I want to talk about uh, Leaving Mississippi, the title piece of the show. Robert Johnson, the famous blues musician from the 20s and 30s, has been amused uh, for a lot of the work that I do. And I, to me, it resonates because um, Robert Johnson was from the cross, the story where the crossroads happened, where they say that you know he supposedly sold his soul to be the baddest guitar player ever, um, happened at the corner of 49 and 61 in Mississippi. But that's really not the way that, 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 that I like to portray that history. Really, that history is more of about when you think of, take a look at the times in the 20s and 30s, the opportunities that African Americans had, it was uh, one of sharecropping. And so this man decided to take uh, his passion, his love of music, and you know, travel the roads, and he left everything behind that was familiar to him. So that story really, really, really resonates with me because I think as a creative person, we have to um, kind of step out there on faith. You know, it's not, you know, it's not anything that's kind of given. You know, we, you know, as an artist, we create, and we're blessed to find patrons and supporters and you know, other colleagues that you know, that, that really make a way for you. You know, I mean, I look around and I see colleagues in the audience, you know, like Phyllis Stevens, a phenomenal quilt maker that's out there, and, you know, Sandy Hall, who's actually going to be, you know, working over at the loft um, to make, you know, to, to, to cater for some things that's doing. She's a phenomenal artist, but a lot of these artists really embraced me when I moved to Atlanta in 2005. And, you know, they, they say, well, you know, Najee, try this show and try that show. And you know, go here and go there. And the great thing about life is, you know, these doors kind of open. So you know, you can't plan everything. You know, and as I plan this talk, you know what I'm saying? As I plan this talk, you know, it just goes to show. You know, things things just don't always work out like that. So if we could just have a conversation, you know, yeah. I want to say thanks for coming out again. You know, I mean, it really means a lot. A lot of the work up there speaks to, to who I am and. And how I want us to be seen, you know, because I think there's a, there's, a, um, there's a war on the black image. You know, I think there's a warfare when you take a look at the media, you know, when you take a look at music, you take a look at how people see us, you know. And I want to do something about that, you know. I want us to be proud of, you know, who we are. I mean, we are proud of who we are. I want us to see it reflected, you know, see it in our homes, see it in our institutions, you know. The, the, the young ones that are coming, you know, what are they going to think when they see, see the stories of inspiration and the, the challenges that we've overcome and the, the community that we've built, you know, and the lives that we've changed and how we've been changed, you know? So that's, uh, that's what I'm hoping you'll get out of this exhibit. Now, another piece, I don't know if Dow actually made it, he was on his way, but he bought the piece. Uh, Dangerfield Newby. No, it's titled Dear Dangerfield, based on the story of Dangerfield Newby. And if you've seen the movie Django, y'all seen the movie Django? Yeah. <laughs> so Jamie Foxx's character is loosely based on Dangerfield Newby. Dangerfield Newby was an ex-slave. He, he had his freedom from his father, and he went to go purchase the freedom of his, of his, of his family. You know, his wife, and I think they had about four young kids. And they had, he had negotiated a price with the, with the enslaver. And see, so, you know, he came with the money. Oh, he was, oh man. <laughs> I got, I got other, other collectors in from Miami. You know, I got to give a shout out. Um, so he went to go purchase the freedom. And, and then so, you know, the guy said, well, no, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to sell her. You know, it's going to take this amount of money. So he leaves and he comes back with that amount of money. And, you know, he said, no, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sell it. So he, just, he, he didn't see any recourse. Like many of us do, you get frustrated. So if you heard about John Brown, who heard about John Brown? Slave rebellion, abolitionist. OK. Uh, for those that don't know, John Brown was white and um, abolitionist. So he ended up joining John Brown's slave rebellion to try to gain the freedom of, you know, of, to, to end slavery. So they went to Harper's Ferry which was an ammunition, you know, um, Armory Depot. They had ammunition, so they was going to try to get the weapons. But they were killed. But in his back pocket were these three letters that his wife had written. And so when you take a look at the piece upstairs, the text that's around the piece uh, speaks to that story. Now, I've got Mercedes here with the museum, if she's in the room. We're going to read that text. 
Okay, maybe she stepped out. Uh, but it's a, it's a heart-wrenching story, and I want you to, you know, get familiar with that. Also, you know, one of the other things that was really important, hey, Khalil, how you doing, sister? All right, cool. Thank you. You know, one of the other stories is really important. You know, as an artist, and particularly, you know, you know, I'm the founder of Black Art in America, so I see a lot of art, you know? And, but the thing is, I see a lot of the same art, you know? We all, and also in school, we always talk about the same leaders. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, but, you know, Frederick Douglass, Martin, Malcolm, you know, Rosa. You know, we got a lot of stories out there, right? I mean, do we have a lot of stories? Yeah. All right then, you know, I'm just, so one of the ones that, that really caught my eye, I was hearing this story about Claudette Colvin, 15 years old, did the exact same thing as Rosa Parks. Nine months prior to Rosa Parks, who talking about her? You know, so as an artist, I can, give, I can lend my, my, my talent to give visual representation to these stories. So, you know, so I know, you know, and we all know about this story. So she's 15 years old, she's on the bus, they, you know, tell her she gotta get out the bus. I mean, she gotta move her seat, get in the back, you know? She's like, nah, I ain't moving, I ain't going nowhere. So they end up, in, they end up putting her in jail. And she fought, she fought at 15 years old, and really, when you think about the leaders, you know, throughout history, it really comes from the young, right? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the young leaders, so, you know, our, our older leaders, we, we need your help and your support but reach back and empower the ones that's coming behind us. 15 years old, she's young. Thank you. So, she's 15 years old and she resists, okay? And a lot of people are not familiar with the story because they say, well, you know, she was 15 years old, she was on no social status. So, I mean, so who really wants to listen to her, right? And uh, there's Mercedes, so we're gonna go back to the danger field here in one second. You know, marketing manager, y'all. And so, um, so she's 15 years old and resisting because she's 15 years old and of no social status. And you know, nobody wants to hear a story. And many would say she's dark complected. So I mean, who wants to put that on the front page and say, okay, this is who we, this is who we follow and who we gonna, you know, lead us through these through these challenges. But it's important for me. I'm sorry about that. It's important for me to tell these stories. Because, you know, and particularly like for, for the men that you're gonna see in the work, in, in the resistance work. Because as a young African American male, I mean, I'm 41, but growing up I never heard about, you know, people who fought against these injustices. You know, it was always turned the other cheek. You know, and I'm not promoting violence, but do we not have a right, you know, to defend our lives, right? Do we not have a right to defend the lives of our family and our community and the things that we believe in? You know, so for me it's really important to tell those stories. Like, you know, uh, the next one that's coming up on this page, Deacons for Defense and Justice, right? First, first armed division of the Civil Rights Movement. Late 50s, early 60s, Bogaloosa, Louisiana. You know, these couple men joined together and said, you know, we tired of this. You know, Klan jacking up our, you know, homes and terrorizing us and this and that. So they openly take up arms, keep the Klan from coming. There's a movie, Forrest Whitaker's in it. But these stories are important because it gives balance you know, it's not I'm, not, I'm not thinking about I'm being inferior or, you know, if I see an injustice that, that I shouldn't speak out where I can speak out or do something about it or protect my family. I mean, let's look at Ferguson. What's going on right now? What's going on in this world? I mean, everybody for me, Ferguson, anybody watching the news, you know, people dying. Hey, don't, don't shoot. Anybody want to take a selfie? Here, get a shot of me. Post this, post this on Facebook. Don't shoot. I'm just black. Don't shoot. I'm just an artist. Don't shoot, I'm a human being. You feel me? Okay. All right, what's up, Paul? My man. Yeah. So these stories are important. They're important for us to know because they don't have these in the history books. And, and you, know, we, you know, they say we're all. You know, I mean, I think maybe everybody's all. Everybody's telling the story somewhere or another, right? You know, so, but we're all community. You know, I mean, I know I take, you know, give, give me the audio book, right? You know, I'm sorry for you readers, you know. We get, give, just give me the audio book. So uh, but anyway, Deacons for Defense, these men stand up and say, you know, enough's enough. And they, they change things. And by the time that they disband, you know, some years later, they had over 20 chapters in the South. I mean, that's how things happen. But let me go back to the danger field. I want, I want you all to hear this story about this, this, this letter that Harriet Newby wrote to her husband, Dangerfield Newby, in 1859. Come on, Mercedes. Mercedes, y'all, give her. Let's give her a little Columbus love, right? 
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Right, I'm pleased to share this with you all this evening. Dear husband, I want you to buy me as soon as possible, for if you do not get me 